All right, Unit 3, Electronics and Photonics. So let's start with some basic circuitry stuff. Mostly a Unit 2 sort of review, but a couple of important things. So we've got circuit basics. And that's looking at, I guess, Ohm's law for starters and applications for current, voltage and resistance within a simple circuit. So let's, I guess, contrast series with parallel circuits. Basic things that you'd need to know to begin with would be in a series circuit the current is the same everywhere within that series section. In parallel, IT, the total current is equal to the sum of the currents everywhere around. Which I guess brings us to sort of that junction principle. If you consider any junction where we've got current coming in, so we call that I1, I2, I3, then that must equal the current going out at any given place. So what we're really saying is I1 plus I2 plus I3 must equal I4 and I5 in total. So we add those together. And it's basically the opposite for voltages. So in series, V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus whatever must equal the voltage of the power supply. So an entire loop must add to the original voltage provided. Whereas in series, everything that's attached to the power supply directly would have the equivalent voltage. Now again, in, in general, you're not going to get a question that says calculate the voltage of R1. It's more likely to be a part of a question where they're just going to expect that you can do this stuff. So this is really sort of basics that's rarely directly tested. It's, it's usually a, a process used to answer a question. And then, of course, resistance. So total resistance when we are in series, you're just adding the resistors together. Whereas in parallel, it's the inverse. Let's call that RP for parallel is 1 on R1 plus 1 on R2. If you have equivalent resistors, then you know you had three resistors the same size all in parallel, then it will be one third that resistance as an equivalent resistor. It's kind of just a little self check that you can do as you work through your questions. So voltage dividers, that was the first sort of real new thing that we've looked at and we can do that by working through using those basic circuit um, equations and solve it. This is I guess just a shortcut to find the voltage when you've got a couple of resistors in series. So voltage divider, so we've got some voltage V in, we have R1, another resistor, R2, and 
and all of that voltage consumed. You can extend this to three, four, five, or as many resistors you want as you want. And what we're usually looking for will be the output voltage across one of those resistors. And the type of question that we expect to see this in would be where we have um, an air conditioner that's going to switch on at a given temperature or a heater that's going to switch on at a given temperature or a light that will switch on at a given intensity. So we've got a light dependent resistor in the circuit. Um, so we've usually got a variable resistor somewhere in there in terms of a thermistor, an LDR or something that's going to vary with you know, as a, as a transducer does. We'll talk about transducers in just a moment. So voltage divider equation, you've got V out over V in. It's a ratios problem. Is um, in this case R2 over the sum of the resistors, which is really saying is over R2 over R1 plus R2. So if we think about it in terms of, uh, we can kind of draw a couple of highlighted lines in. If we look at this sort of area here, nice highlighting, I colour it all in, then that is the bottom line. If I look at across that way, then that is the top line. So the horizontal values must be on the top, the vertical values must all go on the bottom. Okay, transducers. So I've just mentioned those in terms of their application in voltage dividers. A transducer is in, in its simplest form something that we'd call an energy converter. So it converts um, electrical energy into light or um, kinetic energy into electrical energy. So it's, there's, there's sort of some, usually an interface between electric circuit and the outside world. So generally what we're looking at is a resistance that varies with could be heat, could be light or you know, various other forms of energy. What we need to note is that the resistance we're not looking at ohmic resistance, we're looking at something that varies. Generally, we seem to get these graphs that probably are more like a logarithmic scale rather than just a simple um, linear scale. So just beware when you're checking the graph, look at the scales carefully. Um, heat example might be a thermistor. Light may be an LDR. Is that a question? No. Just waving to me. Hey? Stretching. Fair enough. Oh. Okay, so if we look at it, these, these types of questions are going to get a graph that we're going to have you know, maybe intensity of the light and therefore the resistance and you'll get some type of curve. Commonly there's a one or two mark question in there, which is almost just a read off the graph. Given that intensity, work out the resistance or what, what intensity would provide this resistance. Um, often it will be linked in with the voltage divider so that you can solve that um, to turn on or turn off at a given value. So let's say typical questions. Typical exam questions might include something like 
usually in a voltage divider. So we'd have, you know, maybe V in some resistor. and then some other variable resistor. So it could be um, an LDR, it could be a thermistor, something like that, where we want V out on there. So typical questions is that you would expect is calculate the intense uh, calculate the resistor that should be used. Find R to switch on at would be one ex one one question that you can almost bet on seeing. Okay, we've got this scenario. What resistance would allow it to switch on? The next one is should V out be on R or Let's just call it R variable for our LED, our resistor, our sorry LDR, our thermistor, whatever it is. Um, so, should it be placed um, on V out on on the variable resistor, or should it be placed on the resistor that we're sticking in of known value? And you'll be expected to um, justify your answer. So, be something like um, in. Well, let's let's maybe let's look at two examples. As a heater, you want as temperature decreases, our thermistor would increase. Therefore, V out would also increase on the thermistor, therefore V out on our thermistor. And this is probably something that you can put into um, put, in, put onto your cheat sheet just as a quick reference. Okay, and of course the opposite would be for a cooler as T increases, our thermistor will decrease, therefore V out on, well, hang on, let's write V thermistor will therefore decrease, therefore V out on R. So you want your v, for for a cooler you'd put your V out over the resistor so that as that increases in temperature, um, it's going to switch on because the voltage across the resistor will get greater. Of course, similar principles. If you've got a light dependent resistor, you want it to switch on automatically at a given light intensity, like street lights, for example, or they'll give you some random scenario of a student setting up an experiment so the light comes on or it doesn't work, explain why it doesn't work because they've got V out on the wrong value or wrong resistance or you know and you'll have to fix their problem. But the principle is exactly the same, you're just replacing the thermistor with an LDR for example. Alright, LEDs. Okay, generally we've got um, a graph that goes with it, something like the current versus voltage. Okay, we have our threshold voltage or operating voltage here. So that's our voltage in volts, current. Generally it's in milliamps. Okay, so the threshold voltage. What the diode or the LED operates at. Generally, 
unless there's some other information to suggest otherwise given in the question, you would, you would be assuming that we're going to be operating at that threshold frequency. No, not frequency, wrong uh, topic, threshold voltage. Okay, so basically where we're going to see that in a question is we're given some circuit operating at voltage V, then you've got a resistor in there, and then you've got a diode or an LED. Sometimes they may whack another one into that circuit. And so what we need to do is look at this voltage here in terms of the threshold voltage or the operating voltage and then work out, calculate that voltage which is power supply minus V LED and that's going to determine the current that's flowing in the circuit. Okay, so that voltage of the LED comes off. Common question is calculate I for the diode or the LED and that is using to calculate that you want V of your resistor equals IR because this voltage is the same voltage because it's in series. Watch for reverse bias. If we're in reverse bias, what current's going to flow? None. What, what, where's the voltage? Where's all the voltage then going to sit? Yeah, correct. So we will have, where's my ping on? Up there. So we'll have I equals zero, but V LED will have all the voltage across it. There'll be a potential difference either side of it, but it's resisting any uh, current flow. So voltage across the resero, uh, resistor would be zero. Okay. Often, if that question may come up, it's often just a one mark for each or they may only ask one of them if it's put into reverse bias or they may give you a diagram where you need to interpret that it's in reverse bias. Okay, how do we determine if it's reverse bias? Have a look at your power supply or your battery. Okay, we need to look at the positive negative and if we've got the positive there, remember that it is what sort of current? conventional current so it's flowing from positive to negative so it's flowing that way in the direction of our little arrowhead in the diode. So that one's in forward bias. Voltage amplifiers. Okay, they took most of the reason why this is in your topic out of the topic but we still do this part and that's okay because this is fairly easy if we get our head around what we're looking for. So two types of um, voltage amplifier graph that we're going to look at. We've either got, oops, let's try for straight lines. We'll have one that is what we would call non-inverting and that's a positive gradient and then of course we have the more common one that we'll get asked about which is I'll better add some uh, titles V in versus V out V in and V out the more commonly asked one that we get is and inverting. More common because there's more to interpret when we draw the graph. So the negative gradient indicates the non-inverting. Um, the quiescent point, so we've got a quiescent point is the optimum 
operating point. That optimum operating point or the optimum VN is in the middle of the varying voltage that we input. So it may be at zero. More commonly, it will not be at zero. Zero volts won't be part of the input. Not to rule out that they won't do that in your exam, but more commonly it may have an input of maybe um, 100 millivolts to 300 millivolts. So smack bang in the middle at 200 millivolts would be your optimum operating point. Calculating gain. If you're not given gain in the question, gain equals the gradient, which is change in V out, not just V out over V in, it's the change in V out over the change in V in, which is looking at that, that gradient again. Uh, it needs to be greater than 1. So be careful if they have millivolts on the input axis and volts on the output axis, you'll need to multiply the top by 1000. So if your answer comes out at less than 1, it's not actually amplifying anything, so it's failing to do its job, or you've misread the axes. Okay, so important, note that in your head, and no units for gain, because it is volts divided by volts, you cancel out your units. So you may have to interpret something off that graph, fairly likely. Then, you're going to have to draw an output graph. Super, super likely that you'll be doing this. Not always, but typically, it's going to be inverted, but that's determined by your amplifier graph that you're given, or the transfer characteristic graph that you're given. Typically, it's going to involve clipping, may have to draw two graphs. Sometimes you'll get one without clipping and then you'll draw another one which will have clipping in it. Sometimes you'll just have to draw one and that it will have clipping on that one. Not always, but be prepared and look for it. Uh, and always, always, always same frequency. Whatever frequency you're given is what you're going to include in your diagram. So your question will come with something like, this is your input signal. Okay, we're operating at a quiescent point somewhere here. Draw the output signal based on that information. What I would do, and I strongly encourage, and I've said this before, draw it on your graph. Have a look at your transfer characteristic graph, work out if there's clipping. If there's clipping, mark that on your diagram. Okay, they're not going to mark the original diagram in the question. You can scribble on that till your heart's content. And then if it is, if, if it does, if it's a non if it's an inverting, sorry, have a quick sketch of what you think it might whoop, look like when it comes time to do that graph. And then go to your final answer. Make sure that you do have some curve. Okay, we don't want to see. Okay, it's not. Okay. Did you stop somebody in camera? No, I didn't think so. Okay. But yes, Harry, make sure there's some good curves on it. <laughs> so we want to see curved edges. We also want to see the flat. So make sure both are obvious. And make sure that the, whatever your um, V out optimum value equals 
the center. So if your V out, optimum V out is at zero, then it needs to go around zero. If your optimum V out is two volts, make sure you have your equilibrium position at two volts. Okay, but yeah, scribble on it. It's okay to do it in pencil, but I would always maybe work through in a little bit of pencil or scribble all over the other one first and then go over it in pen. Be confident about your answer. Okay, and then the last little bit of the topic talks about photonics. And the whole idea of photonics is modulating light to communicate. Typically or historically, so over the last hundred years or so, modulation has been done uh, with with radio waves. So you've really got two two bits of information that you're sending. You've got the signal itself, the information that you want to send, and then you've got some form of carrier wave. And we've used frequency modulation and amplitude modulation historically. So if we want to do a an analysis of that, we've got Dylan here who is singing this awesome song live on radio. On your Dylan. Now it's plugged in. We have a modulating unit. with which our tower sends out our signal. Got a little antenna attached to our demodulating unit, which then allows us to hear Dylan's angelic voice. Now, let's have a look at what the waves might look at. Let's pick three points. Let's go with here. Actually, let's go with four points. Here, uh, there, and there. Okay, we'll give it a couple of waves. Now, this one, we've got that one, we have this, and then we have, excuse the dodgy drawings. All right, which one's going to correspond to points A, B, C, and D? D. Well, let's start with point C because that's probably the easiest. Which one's going to be point C? It's going to be a modulated wave. And I've actually drawn, well, attempted to draw two different forms of modulation. Here we've got amplitude modulation where limiting the amplitude of our wave. So that would be point C. Or alternatively, frequency modulation, depending on how we modulated it. So both of those would correspond to point C. Which means we've got our carrier wave and our signal. Carrier wave should have a higher frequency than the signal that we're sending. So if we've got that in mind, which of the two waves that we haven't covered would be point B? Upper or lower? 
50-50 here. What did I just say about this frequency for the carrier wave? Higher frequency, which one's got the higher frequency? The upper. So the upper one's a higher frequency, therefore that should be our carrier wave and the signal that we're sending be there, which should also be our demodulated wave that's then going out. Okay, so that's all very good and well, but we've actually talked about photonics and not covered photonics at all just yet. So how do we do this using light? I mean, that's what photonics is. So we're sending info via LED or laser. So this is some, some form of, we're going to use digital info. I mean, we can do it with analog, but what's the point? Varying light, it's much easier and quicker if we're just turning the light on and off in terms of binary on, off, ones and zeros. So it's digital info, and we want a... high response time so that we can send large amounts of info very quickly. Gives us high speed transfer. So we convert the electrical signal into light. We send that down an optical fibre. At the other end, we need to receive it. So receiving info, we want via a photodiode not an LDR. Why would we not send it to an LDR? Yeah. Too slow to respond. We're after a high amount of information being sent we want something we need something at the other end that will interpret that information quickly okay so we have our led giving light off the photodiode must be attached to the circuit in reverse bias for this allows the light to vary the current. So those are probably really the key bits of info that we need to remember for electronics and photonics. Um, it's a smaller section than it used to be. Um, so we need to be really careful, I guess, in using the equations and how we apply them to the given questions. Expect the photo divi uh, voltage dividers and expect that to be linked in with transducers and those questions that we highlighted. Um, but that's it for now.